Welcome to Lake Toxaway United Methodist Church and this service of worship. Um, quickly, I'm going to make an announcement about um, the churches in the upper end of this county, the western upper end of Transvania County, are coordinating an effort to make a response to Hurricane Florence and the victims of Hurricane Florence. So the Lake Toxaway Community Center will be the point of collection they're asking for items that are no clothing, but gently used items, housing type items that can be used. Um, several of our church members have um, agreed to participate in this uh, collection effort. So again, they're going to collect through the end of October and then get the um, donations uh, to the needed locations. I have a list. I'm not going to read it. We'll have it posted. There's um, multiple people who have the list of items that are being collected. I also anticipate the church will make a response as well. Uh, we've been talking about doing a response anyway because of the through the United, United Methodist Committee on Relief so that 100% of our gift would go directly to relief efforts for the variety of natural disasters that have occurred in our country this year. I think that's the only announcement I have to make. Are there any other announcements that need to be made? If not, will you stand for worship? Sometimes we wonder how we have gotten through some difficult situations. We struggle and worry. Listen for God's call to you. And our hymn of worship is hymn number 156. We will only sing the refrain after the fourth verse. So we'll only sing the refrain at the end of the fourth verse.
please be seated. And let us join together as we pray the opening prayer. We draw near to you, O God, source of all understanding, and ask you to draw near to us. Teach us your wisdom from above, that we may bear good fruit in our lives. Root us beside the streams of your wisdom, that the green leaves of our goodness, fed by your insight, may not wither. Amen. You have the appointed scripture passages this for this morning in the bulletin. The Old Testament lesson uh, comes basically from the end of the book of Proverbs, and it ends with a poem, the book of Proverbs does, uh, about a capable wife. Um, I want to just say to you husbands, don't, over, uh, don't read too much into this, okay? <laughs> Because really, um, most scholars say that it also, you remember last week I told you that wisdom is always referred to in the feminine. And so most scholars say that a huge part of this is a description of the qualities of that concept of wisdom. So it's kind of a summary, if you will, of the book of Proverbs. So husbands, I did not give you permission to say to your wife she should get up before you and do all these things that are written here. (laughs) A competent wife, how does one find her? Her value is far above pearls. Her husband entrusts his heart to her, and with her he will have all he needs. She brings him good and not trouble all the days of her life. She seeks out wool and flax. She works joyfully with her hands. She is like a fleet of merchant ships bringing food from a distance. And she gets up while it is still night, providing food for her household, even some for her female servants. She surveys a field and acquires it. From her own resources, she plants a vineyard. She works energetically. Her arms are powerful. She realizes that her trading is successful. She doesn't put out her lamp at night. She puts her hands to the spindle. Her palms grasp the world. She reaches out to the needy. She stretches out her hands to the poor. She doesn't fear for her household when it snows because they are all dressed in warm clothes. She makes bedspreads for herself. Fine linen and purple are her clothing. Her husband is known in the city gates when he sits with the elders of the land. She makes garments and sells them. She supplies sashes to traders. Strength and honor are her clothing. She is confident about the future. Her mouth is full of wisdom. Kindly teaching is on her tongue. She is vigilant over the activities of her household. She doesn't eat the food of laziness. Her children bless her. Her husband praises her. Many women act competently but you surpass them all. Charm is deceptive and beauty is fleeting, but a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. Let her share in the results of her work and let her deeds praise her in the city gates. Here and ends the reading of the Old Testament lesson. Our Psalter lesson is from Psalm 1 which is, uh, many of you know, the book of Psalms is really divided into five separate books. And Psalm 1 is considered the entry into the Hebrew, Hebrew hymnal. And so you will hear some references to the law because for the Hebrew people, the law was reverenced um, uh, with great devotion. So let us read this lesson uh, responsibly. The truly happy person doesn't follow wicked advice, doesn't stand on the road of sinners, 
and doesn't sit with the disrespectful. They are like a tree replanted by streams of water which bears fruit at just the right time and whose leaves don't fade. That's not true for the wicked. They are like dust that the wind blows away. The Lord is intimately acquainted with the way of the righteous. The way of the wicked is destroyed. And then we continue reading in the book of James, uh, which, as I've said repeatedly now, was really a book written for basic instruction about how to live in the Christian community. And James deals with what I guess we would call sin. And so today he's dealing with arrogance and the need for individuals who live in Christian community to attempt to avoid arrogance. Are any of you wise and understanding? Show that your actions are good with a humble lifestyle that comes from wisdom. However, if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your heart, then stop bragging and living in ways that deny the truth. This is not the wisdom that comes down from above. Instead, it is from the earth, natural and demonic. Wherever there is jealousy and selfish ambition, there is disorder and everything that is evil. What of the wisdom from above? First, it is pure and then peaceful, gentle, obedient, filled with mercy and good actions, fair and genuine. Those who make peace sow the seeds of justice by their peaceful acts. What is the source of conflict among you? What is the source of your disputes? Don't they come from your cravings that are at war in your own lives, you long for something you don't have, so you commit murder. You are jealous for something you can't get, so you struggle and fight. You don't have because you don't ask. You ask and don't have because you ask with evil intentions to waste it in your own cravings. Therefore, submit to God, resist the devil, and he will run away from you. Come near to God, and he will come near to you. Herein ends the reading of the epistle lesson. Will you please stand for the reading of the gospel? I'll be preaching primarily from the gospel this morning, so I'll speak more about it uh, in the sermon. The Gospel according to Mark, chapter 9, verses 30 through 37. From there, Jesus and his followers went through Galilee, but he didn't want anyone to know it. This was because he was teaching his disciples. Now the Son of Man will be delivered into human hands. They will kill him. Three days after he is killed, he will rise up. But the disciples didn't understand this kind of talk. And they were afraid to ask him. They entered Capernaum. And when they had come into a house, Jesus asked the disciples, What were you arguing about during the journey? Well, they didn't respond since on the way, they had been debating with each other about who was the greatest. Jesus sat down, called the twelve, and said to them, Whoever wants to be first must be least of all and the servant of all. Jesus reached for a little child, 
placed him among the twelve and embraced him. And then he said, Whoever welcomes one of these children in my name welcomes me. And whoever welcomes me isn't actually welcoming me, but rather the one who sent me. This is the word of God for the people of Christ. Thanks be to God. Remain standing as we sing our hymn of preparation, hymn number 452. Please be seated. Let us pray. Holy God, we come to this day with hearts that seek to worship and offer both our minds and our hearts to you. And may our worship be fitting in your sight. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Redeemer. Amen. So many of you know that of the three synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John's considered a different kind of Gospel, but of the three synoptic Gospels, Mark is the first Gospel that was written. Right? Do you know that? Okay. Well, no? Good. You've learned something. So that's one lesson that you, um, if you took New Testament, you would have learned that. You also know, well, let me ask, what's the shortest gospel? Mark. Mark's gospel is the shortest in length. And there are those who tell us that oftentimes, because remember, in the day of the gospels, the masses, there wasn't, we didn't, you didn't have books and whatnot, so... Uh, the Gospel of Mark may have been acted out in 
uh, places so that people could hear the story of Jesus. And Mark's gospel is a good gospel to act out. I've done it with youth groups, in fact, because it's not poetic like Luke's gospel. If you read Luke, I some of you know Luke's gospel is one of my favorites because Luke's gospel is more poetic and um, he pays attention to detail that Mark often overlooked. Uh, Matthew, uh, in his gospel, was writing to a unique audience, and so there's beauty in that unique uh, audience the Jewish Christians he was writing to. So Mark's gospel is rather fast and action-paced, and, uh, and so Mark is always, in the Gospel of Mark, Jesus is always on the move. And Mark is constantly saying, and then. So um, there's not a lot of room for set changes in the Gospel of Mark because you just go from this set to the next set. There's a sense of urgency in Mark's Gospel about Jesus' life, his teaching, and ultimately a story we read now again that we've already heard. In fact, we just heard it last week, but it's told again to us. The stories that Mark's gospel tells have a, a pointedness to them. And I would say that we sometimes in the 21st century have a tendency to say, so what? Um, especially if the story is one of tremendous familiarity to us, like this particular story, because this story is contained in the Gospel of Matthew and Luke, and of course here in Mark. So, I'm going to give you some background and tell you how fast everything's going. I got that out here to make sure I get the background right, the chronology, if you will. You remember last week's gospel lesson was the rebuke of Peter? Jesus told them this very same thing. First of all, he started by saying, um, who do people say that I am? Who do you say that I am? Peter makes a great confession. You are the Christ, the Messiah, the Son of God. And then Jesus tells the disciples, but there was a crowd around them hearing that. Jesus tells them he's going to face his crucifixion. And Peter says, oh, no, 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 no. And Jesus makes a rebuke of uh, Peter. Well, from that, uh, we have a story that we haven't read this morning. But in between that, Jesus starts traveling and there is a trip up to the mountain where he takes three disciples with him. The transfiguration, you know that story, right? The transfiguration happens. And then just before this story we have read, Jesus performs his last healing in Galilee. Now remember, Galilee was Jesus' home, right? It's where he grew up. And he heals this deaf child. And it's the last healing that he will do in his home territory. And right off the heels of that, we read that Jesus is walking through Galilee with his disciples, so indicating that we've now moved to an intimate group. He's gathered that group, his disciples, to do some teaching and so he tells them for a second time what is to come to him. That he will die and be raised again. And of course you note in this lesson again, Jesus doesn't want many people knowing where he is. And by the way, as he's coming down the mountain in Mark's gospel, uh, with those three disciples who've witnessed the transfiguration, guess what Jesus tells those three disciples? Don't tell anybody about this. So there's that 
messianic secret that we know that is a part of the gospel of Mark. So Jesus, again, tells his disciples when they get together, and we can assume because during Jesus' adult life, he considered Capernaum home. Many people overlook that detail, but scholars debate about whose house he considered home, but that's kind of where he considered home base. They're kind of back in Capernaum. And Jesus, again, tells the disciples, we're assuming they're kind of isolated somewhat, this story that the Son of Man is to be betrayed into human hands and they will kill him. And three days after being killed, he will rise again. And it's still difficult, if not impossible, for the disciples to understand this teaching. Resurrection? Not a concept that the disciples could even begin to understand. Jesus says exactly what he means, however, doesn't he? And it's easy for you and me to understand it because we live in the light of the resurrection. But the disciples had not yet experienced resurrection. So Mark kind of, he almost portrays the disciples as a group of rather dull individuals. But we need to give them some understanding. Because they don't yet understand that Jesus will defeat death itself. The disciples are still looking for a Messiah who will come and overthrow Roman occupation. So they can't fathom the idea that Jesus would die, that he would be buried. And that three days later, he would rise from the dead. Their imaginations, if you will, are still limited by what they hope would happen. Not the reality that a man they have followed and forsaken all will stretch out his arms on the hardwood of a cross so that anyone might come into his saving embrace. The disciples lacked the ability to imagine a world where death isn't the end. And even those of us who live in the light of the resurrection, if we're honest, we sometimes struggle too to remind ourselves we don't live in a world where death is the end. But then there's another thing that comes that fuels the next part of the story of Mark or from Mark's gospel. They reach their destination, which is Capernaum. And they get into the house. And Jesus says to his disciples, what were you arguing about? What were you grumbling about as we were walking along the way? Do you remember those road trips you took with your siblings and your parents as a child? Do you remember sitting, well, actually for us, it was some people sitting and some of us laying in the floorboard. But do you remember those events where you were arguing, but rather quietly? And a lot of it was done with nonverbal. I mean, you know, you were giving the evil eye to a sibling. That evil eye that says, if you dare say a word, I will speak. I will take my hand and knock your block off. Remember? 
And you remember your children doing it, right? And you remember how when the trip would be over, your parents, who I swore had eyes in the back of their heads, would quietly say, hey, what was all the commotion about back there? And I don't know about your parents, but for me, my siblings and I would quickly figure out, can we come up with a story that will be consistent so we don't get in trouble? And usually, if we were honest, our story, or our argument, I should stay, say, was an argument about, I've been here in the floorboard long enough. And I don't care that you're my older sibling with longer legs. Get out of that seat and you sit here so I can have a chance to be in that comfortable seat. It was usually about position, about who got privilege in the back seat of that wonderful old wood grain station wagon that took us from here to there. Remember those? So then Jesus takes the twelve, sits down, which was a common posture for a teacher, and I wished I was sitting right now, by the way. <laughs> but he takes the seated position, again, a common position in that day for a teacher. And he tells them that in the midst of their fighting for who will be first, that the person who really wants to be first or have a position of privilege will be a servant of all. First part of the story or the teaching. And then the second part of the teaching is he takes a child and most scholars say that and the translation we read certainly implies this most scholars say Jesus takes the child and embraces the child. Now, you and I are very common with that because we embrace children all the time, right? Except we now live in a world where we've been cautioned about embracing children without the permission of parents. It's, we've become overly um, hyper-vigilant in our anxieties. But there was a time where we would openly and commonly embrace children to show them love and affection. But in Jesus' day, remember who had the lowest status. Women had pretty low status. They were property. But children had an even lower status. And in fact, children were only considered good because when they got a little bit older, they could work and produce and assist in whatever the family endeavor or profit was. And then, as the child got older and it was of marriage age, if it was a son... Hopefully he would find a good, hard-working wife who would bear a lot more children. Like, you know, 20 would be really good. <laughs> and if it were a female child, hopefully she was one who was robust so that she could be sold to a family where she could produce multiple children for that other family. But children were powerless, vulnerable, considered unable to defend themselves, and really of no good until they reached an age 
where they could be somewhat productive. Those of you who grew up on farms remember, in fact, one of my first memories of knowing that I was a, a, a work hand was when peas came in. Do you know what peas are? Oh, come on. Some of you grew up on a farm. Even up north you had peas. Well, I'm talking about the old kind of what we called field peas. And you had to open those field peas up and push the peas out. I hated that job. Except I hated another job even more. And that was the green beans. Because they had, Leslie, oh, you, I hated that job. And I will promise many times I cheated by just snapping the ends off and then breaking them up without stringing them. And then when they were canned, it was always, Marcus, did you not string these green beans when we were fixing them? I understood that finally I had some worth because I could work. That's the way it was for children. And so Jesus takes this child who has no value, a young child, into his arms. Perhaps even the child is seated in his lap and embraces the child and said, whoever welcomes one of these, one of these vulnerable almost worthless children. Whoever welcomes them welcomes me. And isn't that a far cry from arguing about who has a privileged position in the kingdom of God or as a follower of Jesus? That's how these excerpts from the Gospel of Mark fit together. The snippet about walking through Galilee and this snippet about being in the house in Capernaum. When the church comes together in a place of understanding, Jesus helps us to see a little more about what he is about and what he's not about. Jesus is not about being the greatest. He's about being a servant of all. He's not about winning friends and influencing people. He's about welcoming the vulnerable into the fold. And remember, Jesus tells the disciples, when they welcome, using the child as an example of one of the vulnerable, they welcome him. Now for you and I, that is, for you and me, excuse me, for you and me, that is still hard to kind of grasp. I mean, I'm scratching my head a little bit here because the disciples were looking for a leader who would overthrow the Roman Empire. They're not looking for a servant who welcomes a vulnerable child. Yet Jesus tells them this important part of his inbreaking kingdom that welcoming others, and by the way, some of those others would you, be you and me, the Gentiles. They are welcoming him. Being vulnerable. I don't like to be vulnerable. Do you? 
But being vulnerable, being a servant, being like a child is what Jesus tells his disciples he's come to do in the light of predicting now for a second time his crucifixion, his death, and his resurrection. He wasn't coming to overtake the empire. Oh, he's come to do something far more than that. Something the disciples can't yet grasp. He's come to defeat death. And death is not defeated with a sword, with generals and battles. Death, my sisters and brothers, is defeated with a cross. And specifically, with the cross of Jesus and the shedding of his blood and his resurrection from the grave. Just as he told his disciples here in the Gospel of Mark, even though they did not yet understand it. But here's the good news for you and I. We live on the other side of all that Death is defeated in the death of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. The shedding of his blood, his burial, but most importantly, his resurrection. A resurrection we too participate in when we accept him as Lord and Savior. This, my sisters and brothers, is the good news. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen and amen. We continue together in worship as I invite you to take your bulletin, uh, not your bulletin, excuse me, your hymnal. Turn in the back to page number 884. We continue to use the statement of faith taken from the Methodist Church of Korea. Will you stand as we affirm what it is we believe? We believe in the one God, creator and sustainer of all things, father of all nations, the source of all goodness and beauty, all truth and love. We believe in Jesus Christ, God manifest in the flesh, our teacher, example and redeemer, the savior of the world. We believe in the Holy Spirit, God present with us for guidance for comfort and for strength. We believe in the forgiveness of sins, in the life of love and prayer, and in grace equal to every need. We believe in the word of God contained in the Old and New Testaments as a sufficient rule both of faith and of practice. We believe in the church, those who are united in the living Lord for the purpose of worship and service. We believe in the reign of God as the divine will realized in human society and in the family of God where we are all brothers and sisters. We believe in the final triumph of righteousness and in the life everlasting. Amen. Be to the Father and to be seated. We continue together as we come to that time where we offer our prayer concerns. Um, I'm going to share um, a couple of prayer concerns with you. One is a prayer concern for Mary June Warren. Um, she asked me yesterday to um, invite you to be in prayer for her. 
Um, she was hospitalized this past week. Some of you know that and um, had a procedure, is at home. Um, the procedure she had is different than the procedure that she still waits to have the surgery for her back. So in addition to the back pain, she's got a new issue now. So she appreciates your prayers um, and um, has asked for them. I really don't want to bring a lot of attention to it, but it already, you're all, everybody's out there wanting to know, and I'm tired of, I don't want to retell the story a hundred times. I turned my foot in my yard on Friday, and I had broken a bone in it, and I'll be seeing an orthopedist this week, and it's not a big deal except that it's just a big inconvenience to me. Um, I may be having um, an, in, an outpatient surgery, and prob I probably will be, but it will be outpatient, and I'll be fine. So thank you for your concern, but I really am okay unless I can't drive. And if I can't drive, then I may be calling on some of you to drive for me. Um, but thank you to those of you who have already expressed your uh, concern for me. Are there other prayer concerns you want to name out loud? Praise God. And the damage minimal. Praise God. We do remember many people who are not finding it so and pray for them. Any other spoken request you want to make now? If not, um, as we sing the chorus, the altar is always open to any of you who want to join me. And um, I am going to give you a time for you to do, as we have been doing, naming the names that uh, you might want to name. So let us prepare to pray. Oh God, I thank you so much for scripture and how much I enjoy studying it and the joy of studying it and then having the joy to prepare and to attempt to proclaim and sometimes explain it. I give thanks to you that your word is a living word and that it continues to speak to us this day. I also come to you full of gratitude for the beauty that surrounds us and for the promise of a change in season that is a part of your creation. We also come to you, O oh God, and we offer praises and prayers of thanksgiving as we continue, O oh God, to pray for those who are in harm's way, who are returning to homes that are, if not destroyed, in need of many repairs. We also pray, O oh God, for those that we have held on our prayer list for some time and ask that your mercy and your will would be done in the names and in the lives and situations we continue to hold in our prayers. And now, O oh God, we ask that as we are assembled in prayer, you would hear us 
as we pray the names of those we carry in our hearts and of situations we carry in our hearts. Mary June Warren. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers as we continue to pray the prayer that Christ taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And we are invited to continue in worship as we come to that time where we give our tithes and our offerings. God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him, all of the Let us pray. You are the generous one, full of mercy and goodness for your creation. Send your wisdom with these gifts that they may reach those who need your love and welcome. 
Bring about a harvest of goodness through these gifts, sown in your love. Amen. Our closing hymn is hymn number 700. I know that some of you don't like that hymn, but I appreciate that hymn because its words are so powerful and it fits so appropriately with the gospel reading from Mark. If you notice the first verse and then you notice that last verse or the last several verses, actually. Thank you, Ruth, for choosing that hymn. I didn't ask for it either, did I? Mm -mm. Work of the Holy Spirit, just to let you know. Go and receive this benediction. Remember that Jesus taught in many ways. But in today's lesson, he taught that whoever welcomes a child welcomes me. May we depart to understand that and to fulfill that call. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I'm fine.